We are a family of many generations and many names. Through marriages and remarriages and births and adoptions, we have become a beautiful quilt of colors and traditions. Many families have come together to create who you are today. But the root family and the root name of this family is Ballister. 100 years ago, we were Ballisteraries. Poor, uneducated Italian immigrants who were fearless, honest, hardworking, dedicated to the principles that they knew would make their dreams come true. I am the oldest living Ballistrieri, brother to seven, father of seven, grandfather to 10, and uncle to almost 60 nieces and nephews. I was born Bartolomeo Giuseppe Balistrieri. Our name was legally changed to Ballister in 1953 and I became Barry Joseph Ballister. I'd like to tell you about your family through my life. This is a collage I finished a couple of years ago which took about three and a half years to finish. It begins with the arrival of Bartolo and Maria Balistrieri to America. He was 24, she was 19, and pregnant with her son Matteo, my father. They settled in Newark, New Jersey. Bartolo went to work as a toolmaker in a factory owned by Joseph Fusco, another immigrant. It was the only job Grandpa Ballister ever had. He never learned to speak English and never drove a car. And he lived in one house his whole life. As a young man, Matthew, Matteo, or Marty, my father, also went to work in the factory and met Julia Fusco, who was working as a secretary in her father's factory. Four years later, they were married on Julia's birthday in 1934. Matthew was not cut out for work for anybody, much less a factory, and soon was on the streets of Newark with a horse and wagon peddling fruits and vegetables. I was the first child of Matthew and Julia. A year later, Joseph was born, and a year later, Marianne. We lived in Grandma and Grandpa Balistrieri's two-family house in Newark. Grandma was the world's best cook. Grandpa had the most beautiful garden with peach and plum and fig trees and rows of vegetables and tomatoes. Gardening and good food are an important part of our family's traditions. When I was about four or five years old, I was playing in my father's big Packard sedan parked in my grandfather's yard. The keys were in the ignition. I turned on the key, the car was in gear, the car started out, I drove through the fence and rode, drove the car into my grandfather's garden. It was the, probably the first time I remember being in real serious trouble. In 1941, we moved to Grandpa Fusco's house after Grandma Fusco died. I began school at Sacred Heart. I was four years old. On one Sunday night, we were all in the living room listening to the radio. An announcement came on that the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. I didn't know what Japanese were or where Pearl Harbor was, but I was terrified. Minutes later, my Uncle Jerry was at the door in his uniform to say goodbye. That night began the scariest four years of my life. I created a bunker under my bed. I stashed food and water, a flashlight, a radio, and a blanket. Sometimes we had air raid drills. We had to cover the windows with black shades, and the skies were filled with sirens and searchlights. I collected scrap metal and learned to hate Nazis and tortured the German kid down the street. I was obsessed with the Germans, the Japs, the concentration camps, and the atom bomb. Pretty soon, all my uncles went to war. 
my aunts worked in defense plants. And all the men that worked in my father's store were drafted. So was I. My brother Joe and I started to work in Marty's Market. I was seven years old, he was six. We stood on boxes to reach the scales, and we learned to add long rows of numbers and make change, wait on people, and take care of the store while Marty was in the market. When we weren't in school, we worked 5 a.m. till 11 at night. During the war, my parents bought a big, beautiful 15-room house with fireplaces and big rooms, back stairs and tiny rooms upstairs where the maids used to live. It had a big grassy lawn, big enough for a softball field, and in the old cellar there was a nasty old coal furnace that belched smoke and ashes, but it was a beautiful place to grow up. By 1945, we had five children. We went to Catholic school. I was an altar boy and a choir boy. I took piano lessons and worked in my father's store. I worked every day that I wasn't in school until I graduated college. I love school. When the war was over in August of 1945, we had a wonderful celebration. Marty took the fruit truck and loaded all the neighbors in the truck and we went downtown Newark and drove in the greatest parade on the greatest, happiest day that ever was. I got over the war, learned to live with the bomb, and graduated Our Lady of Sorrows Grammar School, went to Columbia High School, and discovered academic freedom and girls. I ran track, but couldn't train enough because we had to work all the time. Sometimes if I could get off to work, I'd go to dances and parties and had dates. We took buses or walked everywhere. By the time I graduated high school, I had two more brothers, Carmen and Robert. I went off to Villanova University. I was the first baluster to go to college. I loved it, and I loved being away from home. I had lots of jobs and just plain partied and almost flunked out of my first semester. I was also in the NROTC. I loved the uniforms but hated the Navy, the military, the guns, the drills, and the rules. I guess I just never got over the war. I quit the NROTC and got a draft notice to go to Korea, but I managed to never go, and I finished college. During my junior year, my last little sister, Margaret Ann, was born. We are 20 years apart. I made great friends of Villanova. One of them is still my best friend. I was the editor of the literary magazine and graduated with honors on the same day as my brilliant sister Mary Ann graduated from her college in Washington, D.C. My parents, who had made great financial sacrifices to send us to, and send us to college and educate us, graduated the first two balusters ever to go to college on the same day. During my junior year, I had become engaged to Rosemarie Giaimo, who most of you know as Grandma or Mom. We were introduced by our godparents. And while our marriage was not really arranged, our families had met and agreed that it would be good and proper for both of us to get married. I thought she was great, and I think she really liked me too. Five days after graduation, Rosemary and I were married. We had an apartment. She worked as a secretary near our home, and I commuted to my job as in an advertising agency in New York City. Nine months after our wedding, Matthew was born. We bought a little house and spent weekends at the Jersey Shore. I started to make a lot of money, and two baby girls were born, Cynthia and Cheryl Ann. We built a big, new, beautiful house in Livingston, New Jersey, where Carolyn was born. Then there were four. It was about then that the roof fell in. I forgot who I was and became a different person. I was the ad man who became a madman. I was a peddler's son 
peddling cheap goods from a TV screen instead of a horse in a wagon. I became a godless man with fat pockets. I was lost and drunk with power, wealth, temptation, women, vanity, and self-worship. In 1965, Rosemary and I divorced, and eventually my beautiful family was broken up and moved away. I became separated from my parents, my brothers, my sisters, my real friends, and my reality. My heart was broken. I quit my job when I saw how empty it had become and moved upstate to a farm. My son, who was 12, came to be with me, and together we left everything behind. We journeyed for more than two years through Europe and Morocco, tropical islands, and finally we landed in frozen Canada where we worked for the Skidoo Company doing advertising for snowmobiles. It was the last advertising I ever did. In 1972, Matthew and I arrived back in Woodstock. I began a new life based on old skills. I opened the fruit stand. We called it Sunfrost. Opposite ideas living together to create a new idea. It was a country version of an old time Newark market. I had turned back time 40 years and just like old Marty's market it was, please don't touch the fruit. In 1977, my mom died. I loved her very much. I had a different childhood with her than my brothers and sisters did. I guess she got tired along the way with eight children. But I remember her when I was young and I still miss her. By God's grace and a lot of hard work, we built a wonderful business. I was a single man with a great son and after a season of intense work, I would live on an island in the Caribbean. I swam and fished and ran on the beach and painted. I ate great food and slept in my hammock. Sometime between Woodstock and the islands, I found time to build my own house. My life was perfect again, but I messed it up again and went into a deep, dark depression. I turned Sunfrost over to Matthew and began to write the fruit and vegetable stand book. I was told by an editor to write. And I said, I don't know what to write about. And she said, write about something you love. Well, I knew I loved fruits and vegetables. And so I began the writing. I dedicated the book to my grandfather, Bartolo. It was a good piece of work. And I was invited to be a guest on the Regis Philbin show. I was invited back 20 times. I was the fruit and vegetable guy. One day the producer asked me to juggle, juggle apples and I wouldn't do it. So I got fired. But the book was reprinted five times. While preparing the book for publication, I met a young woman and married her in 1985. Crystal Ballister was born in 1986. A second girl named Cherry was born and died in 1987. And Carly was born in 1989. In 1990, we moved to Florida. It was a disaster in every way. I came back to Woodstock alone. It was a brief reunion, but the marriage ended. It was the beginning of another new life. But I vowed I would never allow any circumstance to keep me from my children again. With the loss of Cindy, Cheryl, and Carolyn, a wound that never healed, I made my fatherhood the most important part of my life. In 1992, I got sick with colon cancer. After two surgeries and two years of chemotherapy, along with the constant custody battles, I was healed and brought back to life. In 1995, Crystal and Carly came to live with me. I was a single dad with two little girls. I was determined to find a way back to all of my children and heal us all the best we could. About that time, 
I was encouraged by a friend to visit a small church called the Morning Star Christian Fellowship in Kingston, New York. I had been struggling with money, health, fatherhood, and loneliness. I had been trying to do it on my own. Jesus saved my life. His Spirit came upon me and made me realize I could not live my life on my own terms anymore. I broke, I surrendered, and gave my life to Him in His hands. Suddenly, wonderful work assignments came my way. The girls flourished. I began talks with Cheryl. My faith was my rock. I met a woman named Myra, and she and I had a loving friendship for many years. The girls were growing. Matthew was making plans to build a new Sunfrost. I was working at the Devereaux Foundation, a resident school for dual diagnosed troubled children. I had just received an international award for a film I had done for Devereaux. We were about to buy a new house when I got sick. One, two, three, four, five, six heart attacks in the summer of 2002. I had six heart attacks in three months between Memorial Day and Labor Day. I spent most of the summer of 2002 in hospitals. My heart could no longer function on its own. With death at the door, I was transferred to the Albany Medical Center to be evaluated for a heart transplant. It was decided I was too old and too sick, and they prepared to send me home. I asked for a Bible, closed my eyes, opened the book at random, pointed my finger, and read the following. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. The nurses helped me print that verse on a piece of paper, and I stuck it on the wall. Two days later, they changed their minds, and I was listed for a new heart. It took two months, but on Halloween night, I received the donor heart from a 28-year-old African-American woman. I was given a new body to go along with my new spirit, two gifts from God that saved my life. Since 2002, Crystal and Carly have graduated college. Matthew got married and has a beautiful, thriving business. Cindy, Cheryl, and Carolyn are well married, and their lives are a testimony to their courage and their character. Grandsons, granddaughters, nieces, and nephews have graduated married, and established their places in the world. My brothers and sisters are thriving, overcoming, and living their lives on their own terms. There are Waterberries, Roosings, Coons, Wades, Kaufmans, and Constantinos, and names I don't even know, creating and establishing new generations with pride and character. I've had two one-man art shows and teach 7th and 8th grades at a private Christian school. I have a beautiful woman in, her, in my life. Her name is Tony, and we share every day. I fill my life with gardening, good food, good friends, prayer, taking care of my precious heart, and trying to be of some service to others. Well, this was a short journey through a life that is part of all of our lives. I believe that the same qualities that came from Maria and Bartolo on that big black ship that came from Sicily over a hundred years ago are still alive in the blood and the spirit of the new generation. Take care of your heritage, take care of each other, and take care of yourselves. Azaluta.